franktalks.com. Hi, I'm Frank, because I have to be. And you're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles. Hello, how are you? Mr. I'm fine. Dress up, exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. Sit down, make yourself comfortable. Let's begin. You're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles. And I'm Frank because I have to be. Today's show, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to abandon our regular Frank Talks format and present an interview that was done even before this show existed. It's an interview I did with Mr. Ernie Coombs, known to Canada as Mr. Dressup. At the time, I was a graduate student in the communications department of McGill University, and as part of my thesis, I got to meet with and interview Ernie Coombs. I'm going to read you now the dedication page of my thesis. This study is dedicated to the late Ernie Coombs, also known to Canadians as the character Mr. Dressup, who on August 13, 2001, granted me what became his last recorded interview just four short weeks prior to his final departure that year. His untimely passing has left a great emptiness for those of us who grew up learning from him and for those of us who got to meet with him, even if only for a brief time. Ernie Coombs had a way of touching people of all ages, deep inside each of us, in that special place, where we cherish our most pleasant memories. That place of new possibilities, new learning experiences, that place where we find our connection with the people and world around us. His gift of being able to magically connect with everyone who knew him or of him was also the lesson he taught others to share with one another. When looking to achieve greatness in children's television, it is Mr. Dressup that has set the standard to strive for. This study is dedicated to his legacy, and for anybody who ever set out to achieve a big fat idea. As I just read to you, this is his last official recorded interview, and we're going to present segments from that interview that won't have a very linear flow to it. I only included elements here that I thought would be of interest to listeners, as many of the questions were related to my thesis topic at the time. Nonetheless, I thought that a tribute show to Ernie Coombs, Mr. Dressup, would be the right thing to do. The interview begins with a very first question that is, how similar are the character, Mr. Dressup, and the performer, Ernie Coombs? Let's go to that interview now. To the first question, mm-hmm. as I said, there's, uh, there's practically no difference between the character, Mr. Dressup, and myself, Ernie Coombs. I started out that way when we first uh, the program was first created, which was then called Butternut Square, and uh, was decided to call the character Mr. Dress Up because one of the things I did on uh, on the show was dress up and pretend to be different characters. But uh, basically, it's myself doing things that I like to do and always have liked to do and uh, and uh, could do fairly easily. So you'd say you probably have some of those same value systems or set values? Uh, yeah, actually, I've always maintained that uh, being Mr. Dressup has probably made me a better person because uh, uh, I think because of, of doing the show for so long and uh, you know, there are certain uh, decent values in the show and mm-hmm. I think that a lot of them became embedded in me. Not that I think I was a very wicked person to be, <laughs> but uh, uh, having that kind of persona uh, on the television, uh, you know, uh, rubs off and onto the person. I think uh, I know all of the other other people that uh, are just you know really beastly off camera, but uh, it wasn't my way. Okay. Now, the next question I have is, who or what exactly owns Mr. Dressup? Do you own the character? Was this something you signed over to the studio? Uh, No, uh, the studio, uh, CBC created it. Um, 
I said, uh, years ago, oh God, it's almost 40 years ago, I guess, uh, that the program uh, Butternut Square, Square was created, and uh, they wanted me to play a character on it. And uh, Bruce Atwich, who was the executive producer, and I had a meeting to discuss uh, actually what I would do on the show, because at the time they knew they, uh, they wanted to use me, but they didn't know just what uh, to pass on. Anyway, uh, out of that meeting came the name Mr. Dress Up, and I really can't remember whether I named the name, uh, made up the name, or whether Bruce did. I rather think that he did. Um, anyway, CBC owns the, uh, the character Mr. Dress Up and the uh, program, um, but they're very, very good about letting me do personal appearances and tour and uh, that sort of thing and say, you know, Mr. Dress Up is appearing here <coughs> in person. Um, and uh, one, uh, uh, some time ago, one of uh, the uh, CBC uh, legal people said that when the program ceased to be broadcast on CBC, they would give me the rights to it. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's going to go on longer than I am. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what I would do with the rights. <laughs> okay, so you don't necessarily own the rights of Mr. to the character Mr. Dressup, but That's they right. they don't give you a hard time about using the name to promote uh, your own appearances. That's right. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to ask you that when you do do certain types of work, say a narration on a series, you're credited as Ernie Coombs, not at all as Mr. Dressup. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I've done. Uh, trying to think of, uh, well, of course, one example is my, uh, what I'm doing at Sinar. Right. Um, of course, it's assumed that um, everybody in Canada will know who, Mr., uh, who Ernie Coombs is anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I played uh, uh, in the Christmas uh, holiday time musicals mm -hmm. in Toronto, uh, I was billed as uh, Ernie Coombs TV's Mr. Dress Up. Which of course is not, uh, it's just describing which Ernie Coombs that is. Uh, right. But uh, there's no problem with that either. <clears throat> okay. But normally, if you would do, say, a public appearance uh, for young children as Mr. Dressup, this is something you'd have to work out with the CBC? Uh, yeah, originally in my contract it just stated that uh, any uh, personal appearances I did, I had to get permission. Uh, from CBC to do, but a long time ago we just didn't bother with that because I'd go on uh, three-week tours, in which I would do uh, maybe 60 or 70 performances, wow. and it was a little cumbersome to try to get, to, you know, just to get permission. Or, I never really knew who to ask anyway. It was just a protection clause in, in the contract, so that if I had done something, I think as Mr. Dressup and disgraced the the name and CBC, then they would have some legal uh, recourse. Recourse, but uh, they, we've always had a very good relationship, you know, and they they love it when I go on tour because it's uh, promotes the show for the, for the corporation. <coughs> All right. Um, the next question, which I think is a really gray area for a number of people who are fans of the show, I know I've done some uh, research on the internet about this, and the stories are incredibly conflicting. When Casey and Finnegan were replaced, what were the issues considered in that decision? Um, did the original performer own the characters herself and refuse permission for another puppeteer? Or was the issue of character continuity uh, factored in because now a new puppeteer would take over a well-established uh, method of performance? Okay, what... Uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm foggy this morning. Yeah, it's a foggy day here. Um, but what happened was uh, Judith Lawrence, who created Casey and Finnegan, and uh, for the bulk of the of the sh shows up till the time she retired, she did all of the puppets: Casey and Finnegan, uh, Aunt Bird, Aunt Bird, Alligator Al, and Hester the Witch. Mm -hmm. uh, Judith uh, had been saying for a few years after she got a. Uh, she got a house out in, in British Columbia uh, on Hornby Island and Ocean, just loved it there and spent all of her summers there. And uh, she 
kept saying, you know, we ought to just uh, go into reruns and then we'll all go to the seashore. <laughs> and uh, eventually she said, well, I, I, I think I am going to retire. And so she, uh, the year before she retired, she uh, actually commuted. She'd come back to uh, from British Columbia and in a certain amount of time do a, a number of shows with Casey and Finnegan in them. Mm-hmm. So um, there was never any question that she wouldn't take Casey and Finnegan with her. They were her creations. Uh, in fact, uh, Finnegan existed before the uh, before uh, Butternut Square did. There was one puppet that she just happened to have. Um, so uh, there was no question that uh, we would ever try to replace them because her voice and her the characters of, that she created with the puppets were so unique that it would have been impossible. And uh, she wouldn't, I, I'm sure in any case, she wouldn't have granted permission. To, uh-huh. you know, it's like having somebody replace your own child. Right. So there was no question that they would have to be replaced. So what we did was uh, we thought we'll have to uh, integrate a new puppet but uh, do it slowly. So we created uh, the uh, character of... Uh, Truffles was a little pink, fluffy puppet. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did that because we didn't want to have a little girl puppet or a little boy puppet because that would be too much like Casey at the time. Mm-hmm. So we decided we would have a, a, a creature, and uh, nobody would really know whether it was a boy or a girl or a space alien or what. So that was done deliberately? Uh, yes. <clears throat> and uh, so. Uh, for a while, uh, we we would have truffles appear in shows where Casey and Finnegan were. And then uh, we added another puppet, uh, Chester the Crow was the next one. So we had Chester and Truffles, and then we'd do some shows with just Chester and Truffles and without Casey and Finnegan. And uh, so we shuffled all these shows together. And of course, every, every show is repeated at least no, I don't know, at least, at least three times, I think. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, there would be a, a few shows without Casey and Finnegan, and then there would be some with Casey and Finnegan, and then some with Casey and Finnegan and Truffles. Um, so it was sort of mixed up in that way. And eventually, uh, Judith completely retired, and uh, uh, that was the end of Casey and Finnegan, although they went on in reruns for another couple of years. But we never had a specific show that said uh, goodbye Casey and Finnegan Uh, in the uh, first days when they weren't present on the show we'd say uh, Casey's uh, gone off to visit somebody or he's at daycare or at at a nursery school and Finnegan's out playing you know we'd just make some light excuse nothing big Mm -hmm. for uh, their absence so uh, they just sort of faded away over the years and uh they were uh, last seen. We did a. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think it was a retrospective. Uh, uh, maybe it was our 25th anniversary show that we did, uh, and uh, Judith and Casey and Finnegan made a, an appearance in that. But uh, and she's using them out there on the Hornby Island. Uh, uh, she does a little uh, entertainment for kids and does a lot of. Uh, environmentally environmental uh, protection kind of uh, and does she does she uh, promote her own Casey and Finnegan shows with you know as seen on Mr. Dressup um, I don't know <laughs> I okay. haven't seen one uh, it's been years of course since she was on the show mm-hmm. and uh, but uh, people your age remember them very 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 vividly strongly, yes it made a big impact. Reading from a good book. Hi, I'm Stephen, and welcome to Frank Talks, a reading from. 
Today's reading comes from Mr. Dress Up, Icon of a Generation by Clara Kaufman and Christian Arneson, excerpts from an article. It was standing room only as more than 300 students gathered to meet their childhood friend, Ernie Coombs, better known as Mr. Dress Up. Most English-speaking Canadians under the age of 40 grew up watching Mr. Dress Up on morning television. During his visit to the pub, Coombs told the story of Mr. Dress Up's creation. From his beginnings as a technician, set designer, and painter, Coombs came to Canada from the U.S. in 1963 with his good friend, Fred Rogers. Coombs became the original puppeteer for the TV program Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and one year later appeared in the Butternut Square program. This show later evolved into the well-known and much-loved Mr. Dress Up show. The original format, featuring Mr. Dress Up, Casey, and Finnegan, lasted until the early 90s when puppeteer Judith Lawrence retired and new puppets Truffles, Annie, and Chester were brought onto the show. Unfortunately, the absence of Casey's family was never resolved, nor was it revealed why he lived in a treehouse in Mr. Dressup's backyard with his faithful dog Finnegan. Despite the incredible happiness felt by the majority of the crowd, some individuals were a little disappointed with the absence of Casey and Finnegan. These much-loved personalities were unable to attend, as they now live on Hornby Island in a suit case. The much-loved Mr. Dressup and his puppet friends enjoy a mixture of stories, crafts, songs, drawing and dressing and repeat performances of this perennial favorite. Daily, Mr. Dressup invites children into his creative world and makes them feel safe, important, and valued. Mr. Dressup teaches children about morality and tolerance and opens up a world of imagination for them to enter and explore. And that was an excerpt of Mr. Dress Up, Icon of a Generation by Claire Kaufman and Christian Arneso. For Frank Talks, a reading from, I'm Stephen. You're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles. And I'm Frank because I have to be. Today's show, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to abandon our regular Frank Talks format and present an interview that was done even before this show existed. It's an interview I did with Mr. Ernie Coombs, known to Canada as Mr. Dressup. At the time, I was a graduate student in the Communications Department of McGill University, and as part of my thesis, I got to meet with and interview Ernie Coombs. I'm going to read you now the dedication page of my thesis. This study is dedicated to the late Ernie Coombs, also known to Canadians as the character Mr. Dressup, who on August 13, 2001, granted me what became his last recorded interview just four short weeks prior to his final departure that year. His untimely passing has left a great emptiness for those of us who grew up learning from him and for those of us who got to meet with him, even if only for a brief time. Ernie Coombs had a way of touching people of all ages, deep inside each of us, in that special place where we cherish our most pleasant memories, that place of new possibilities, new learning experiences, that place where we find our connection with the people and world around us. His gift of being able to magically connect with everyone who knew him or of him was also the lesson he taught others to share with one another. When looking to achieve greatness in children's television, it is Mr. Dressup that has set the standard to strive for. This study is dedicated to his legacy and for anybody who ever set out to achieve a big fat idea. As I just read to you, this is his last official recorded interview, and we're going to present segments from that interview that won't have a very linear flow to it. I only included elements here that I thought would be of interest to listeners, as many of the questions were related to my thesis topic at the time. Nonetheless, I thought that a tribute show to Ernie Coombs' Mr. Dressup 
would be the right thing to do. Let's go to that interview now. So I'm going to read you the question here. What influence does a performer have in the character he plays? And should a performer of a character be considered a part creator in that character, as opposed to just an actor who's interpreting a writer's work? Well, uh, I think an actor has a great deal to do with the character. Otherwise, you could take, uh, you wouldn't even have to have auditions. Just take any actor and say, okay, here's the script, and you be this thing. One actor can uh, uh, perform a character uh, better or worse than another actor, and it's uh, due to what the actor has put into the role himself. Um, I don't think there's any question that the, a character that's created by a certain actor, even the, if the part is totally scripted, uh, the character is, to a great extent, the creation of the uh, the actor who's playing it. And especially in my case, uh, since part of what we did was ad lib, uh, we'd follow a script, but uh, uh, you know we were. I was being myself, Ernie Coombs, Mr. Dress Up, and uh, there, there, there would be no doubt about it. So. Uh, you ad libbed? Uh, yeah. The the scripts were written out in uh, in regular script form, but uh, I, I couldn't remember uh, doing two shows a day. I couldn't remember all that dialogue anyway. So we just work with the situation and uh, you know follow the the dialogue as closely as possible. But it was uh, uh, yeah, an awful lot of uh, a lot of it was just off the tops of our heads. Wow. And do you think that an actor should be considered a part creator of a character? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And especially, uh, you know, uh, on a long-running uh, show like uh, Cheers, I mean, those two guys uh, well, became, became the characters they were portraying. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's no doubt of, about it that they, they partially owned the characters or, or in a... In a moral sense, they own the characters. Mm -hmm. In comparison to yourself, who you've been Mr. Dressup now for over 30 years, uh, the Cheers characters, they've always, you know, George Went, John Ratzenberger have always played the Norman Cliff characters. Yes. Do you think that that's um, very significant in terms of, you know, is it because they've played the same character for so long? Or is it just a matter of when a, when a performer is hired to play a character? Immediately in that moment, that performer takes on a certain role of creation. Yeah, I, uh, I, I would think it would be very difficult to replace a character. Um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, if we want, if we had wanted to replace Casey with another Casey, mm -hmm. uh, it would take a long time before that uh, character would uh, come into its own, I should think. Now, I don't know the, uh, uh, any, uh, you know, the two examples you, uh, you gave. Uh, right. I, I don't watch enough television, so I don't remember. Uh, were they uh, principal characters? Uh, uh, yeah, they were. Incidental characters. They were principal characters. Well, uh, I guess it would work, but... Uh, of course, it happens in plays when you get uh, somebody who will drop out of the cast and somebody else takes takes over the part. Uh, right. Sometimes it's, it's better or worse. But on a, on a long-running show, uh, as, as I said, I think that the, the characters, uh, it may be created in the mind of a, of a writer, but uh, the actor brings so much to it that uh, it's a... Uh, you know, so that's something that uh, cannot be, you can describe a character when you're uh, writing a, a play, mm -hmm. but uh, it's the actor puts so much of himself into it that uh, it can't be totally the writer's creation. Mm -hmm. Dress 
exclusive. Hello, how are you? Mr. I'm fine. Dress up exclusive interview with Mr. Dress up. Sit down, make yourself comfortable. Let's begin, shall we? First of all, do you live on the set or do you have your own house that you go to after work? Is there a Mrs. Dress up? Was your father also in the dressing up business? Do you plan on writing a book about your life? And if so, which publishing company would you approach? Do you drive to work? Do you whistle the theme to the show as you drive? Do you get the jitters before every show? I mean, the pressure must be enormous. Exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. Exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. What's the deal with Casey? I mean, what the hell is that thing anyways? Is it a boy or a girl or what? If it's a boy, then why the high voice and the girlish haircut, not to mention the extremely pink cheeks? And Casey lives in a treehouse with a dog. Is that healthy? What's your social insurance number? Do you play croquet? Does anybody? Why do you hang out with puppets all day anyways? I mean, do you ever socialize with humans at all? Like, did you ever go out for a beer with the friendly giant after the show? Exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. Exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. When you get dressed in the morning, do you feel like you're at work? Have you ever been to Marineland? You want some more coffee, Mr. Dress Up? What's the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? Have you ever considered contact lenses? Is there a god? I mean, what's it all about, Mr. Dress Up? Is there any point to it all? Have you ever met David Bowie? Ever try one of those pizza pocket things there? Are they any good? Have you ever killed a man? Exclusive interview. Don't worry, this is off the record. Mr. Dress Up. Exclusive interview with Mr. Dress Up. Okay, well, thanks a lot for coming. I think I got everything I need here. This should be really good. See ya. Oh, don't worry about the boss, really. It was broken already. No, no, don't worry about it. Get out of here, you crazy guy. Hi, I'm Stephen, and welcome to Frank Talks, a reading from. Today's reading comes from Are You a Giant or Dress Up? An article published Tuesday, November 6th, 2001, Author Unknown. Excerpts from an article. It's just amazing, really. Generations of Canadian children were raised with little plastic and polyester puppets as their heroes and teachers. Casey and Finnegan, Rusty and Jerome, those wacky, silent, overstuffed cats at the piano and harp in the giant's anteroom. Today Jasper and I visited a special exhibit at the Children's Museum of the Canadian Museum of Civilization. The CBC has opened the vault on the original puppets and sets for some of my generation's favorite children's shows. Mr. Dressup, the friendly giant among others. I must admit, my heart leapt when I walked into the exhibit and saw, right there, Casey's treehouse, including the whole tree. Incredible! There it was, the shuttered windows, the little walkway porch, the veiny oak tree, the secret side door entrance. Upon closer inspection, the whole thing is made of cardboard and felt paper mache like something an art class would assemble for a one-time stage production. The real treat was being able to see inside the back where puppeteer Judith Lawrence knelt for hours and kept the rapt attention of thousands upon thousands of kids. She had carpet padding stapled to a ledge to protect her knees. Thank you, Judith. How could this simple little treehouse have been so important to me? And what kind of brilliance led to its creation? There were no wild combat creatures on Mr. Ressa and no Pokemon-style fantasy, aside from what came out of the tickle trunk or from Ernie Coombs' pen. And now you have to admit, the Casey Finnegan tag team was a strange one. Nowadays, you'd be laughed out of the boardroom if you pitched a children's show concept that featured a single man who had a four-fingered kid and his mute dog living in a tree in a backyard. These shows just would not be produced today. 
That's a shame. I want Jasper to get to know and love my dear plastic and polyester friends. And that was an excerpt of Are You a Giant or Dress Up? An article published Tuesday, November 06, 2001 by author unknown for Frank Talks, a reading from. I'm Stephen. You're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles, and I'm Frank because I have to be. Today's show, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to abandon our regular Frank Talks format and present an interview that was done even before this show existed. It's an interview I did with Mr. Ernie Coombs, known to Canada as Mr. Dressup. At the time, I was a graduate student in the Communications Department of McGill University, and as part of my thesis, I got to meet with and interview Ernie Coombs. I'm going to read you now the dedication page of my thesis. This study is dedicated to the late Ernie Coombs, also known to Canadians as the character Mr. Dressup, who on August 13, 2001, granted me what became his last recorded interview just four short weeks prior to his final departure that year. His untimely passing has left a great emptiness for those of us who grew up learning from him and for those of us who got to meet with him, even if only for a brief time. Ernie Coombs had a way of touching people of all ages, deep inside each of us, in that special place where we cherish our most pleasant memories, that place of new possibilities, new learning experiences, that place where we find our connection with the people and world around us. His gift of being able to magically connect with everyone who knew him or of him was also the lesson he taught others to share with one another. When looking to achieve greatness in children's television, it is Mr. Dressup that has set the standard to strive for. This study is dedicated to his legacy and for anybody who ever set out to achieve a big fat idea. As I just read to you, this is his last official recorded interview, and we're going to present segments from that interview that won't have a very linear flow to it. I only included elements here that I thought would be of interest to listeners, as many of the questions were related to my thesis topic at the time. Nonetheless, I thought that a tribute show to Ernie Coombs' Mr. Dressup would be the right thing to do. Let's go to that interview now. I do remember watching some later episodes where one of the newer puppet characters was referring to you as dad. Is that correct, or is that I, just my imagination? I think it was your imagination. <laughs> they didn't. They never refer to you as dad. No. They always refer to you as Mr. Dresser. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just remember seeing a puppet character that referred. No. Unless we were playing a. You know, doing a little make-believe story, and I was supposed to be the dad. You know, that might have been it, because I only had caught a glimpse. Yeah. because okay. no, uh, it was always Mr. Dress-Up. And it was always kind of odd. We'd have guests on the show, and they would call me Mr. Dress-Up, and I'd call them by their first name. <laughs> <laughs> I always kind of like that. You know, because you, you established yourself as the adult on the show, and everybody else got to be... Uh... Yeah, even though there were, some of the guests were older than I was. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so just to just to recap, um, Judith, in fact, just owned the characters outright. Yeah. Uh, they weren't created specifically for the show. Uh, well, uh, Casey was, but uh, Finnegan wasn't. And she retained the rights on Casey. Yeah. And there was never a dispute about that. There was never you, because from the way you're describing it, the way they let you use Mr. Dress Up on tour and that, it seems it was really a good foundation. Um, of just, you know, good faith and good sentiment. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the show. Yeah, is... though, that's a wonderful thing about it. Uh, that's why it, didn't, it wasn't an onerous task to do it all those 30 odd years because we all liked each other and nobody, you know, wanted to push themselves into being the star. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all very even. Uh, Judith and I uh, made the same salary. 
we negotiated together and uh, <clears throat> so neither one of us made more than the other um, also at, at one time I uh, uh, you know used to do a lot of touring and in the early days uh, Judith would tour with me mm -hmm. and then uh, she got tired of touring she wasn't really a showbiz person and she got tired of touring so I was doing it solo and then uh, a friend of mine that used to book my tours for me conceived the idea of uh, having Casey and Finnegan on the show but using a puppeteer and uh, using uh, having Judith tape Casey's voice so we did that for a couple of years we made a uh, larger Casey and a larger Finnegan which showed up better on stage and uh, Casey's of course Finnegan didn't need a voice which made it very handy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we sent a script to Judith and uh, she recorded it and uh, we got a person who could uh, uh, handle puppets mm -hmm. and uh, it was beautiful because uh, Finnegan's mouth moved, but he didn't need have a voice. And of course, Casey's mouth uh, didn't move, so uh, we could uh, do a tape, and you didn't have to lip sync the puppet. Wow. And the only difficulty was me coming in with my dialogue at the right time in between Casey's recorded lines, and it was pretty hilarious when we were first trying it. <laughs> but after a while, it worked so smoothly and seamlessly that. Uh, one place we played, one of the um, technicians backstage said, geez, that guy that's doing the puppet sounds exactly like the, like the real Casey. It's amazing. He had no idea that it was on tape. And uh, I found that uh, in the spaces between, in our conversation, I could throw in a few other words and uh, you know, maybe a sentence or two in a, in a pause. And uh, it, was, uh, it was very, very realistic. And a little hairy at first, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, it worked uh, beautifully. People had no idea that it wasn't Judith Lawrence actually doing the puppet. You, you know, listening to this story, and when I was in uh, university, I was doing a puppet show uh, for the student TV station there. Uh -huh. And when when that ended, and I wanted to try and take these characters to another to another forum. Um, we actually considered doing theater along those lines, but we were very skeptical as to whether or not this type of thing would work out with the pre-recorded voices and you know. Yeah, uh, well, it uh, it does. Uh, there was uh, one, <laughs> some, uh, just a funny little aside. Uh, uh, there was uh, one point I was, I, my line was, uh, Casey, do you know where my wa uh, magic wand is? And his response was, I think I do. And I don't know why, but I kept saying, Casey, uh, would you get my magic wand? And of course he'd say, I think I do, which didn't make much sense, but uh, I guess uh, nobody noticed it. But, but it is possible to, to do it. It's, uh, it's kind of fun. Good. Okay. Um, and just out of curiosity, when you did the live performances, using the Casey and Finnegan characters and Judith uh, obviously agreed because she uh, oh yeah she uh, of course uh, we uh, uh, she got a percentage a royalty on each show you know percentage of the right. of the sales or okay so there was there was some sort of agreement in place that oh yeah there's no way we we would do it you know if she didn't want to do it uh, what rights, if any, do you think a public has to the images of characters such as Mr. Dressup, Casey, Aunt Bird, Alligator Al, Chester? Shouldn't those same fans be free to utilize the characters in ways that the legal, legal owners may not approve of? Um, and the example I gave here is putting those images on a fan-based website. Um. I don't, I'm sort of two minds about that. A fan-based website uh, would just mean that they would uh, that the, they're they're done in, with the best of intentions. If, uh, on the other hand, if they uh, use the images uh, on an obscene T-shirt, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, then I'd say they they would, should be sued or told to cease and desist. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been. Uh, uh, very easy about uh, you know if somebody wants to uh, well for instance uh, uh, 
I, I own the rights to the Tickle Trunk, and it's my creation, and the name Tickle Trunk is, is uh, copyrighted in my name. Okay. A number of places I've been around the country, uh, people have, uh, some people came up to me proudly and said, uh, we've got a shop that sells children's clothes, and we call it the Tickle Trunk, after your Tickle Trunk. Oh, and I feel great about that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a kind of a... A, a tribute in a way, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they've done it under the best of, for the best of reasons. So uh, uh, I don't mind that at all. Um, you know, since so they use the name Mr. Dress Up, of course I don't use that, uh, own it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, there, there was for a while in Toronto, I remember seeing a panel truck with uh, the name Mr. Dress Up on it. And it turned out that what they did was uh, they were would uh, clean and refurbish cars, you know, uh, what do they call it, de car detailing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> that's what they did. But before I could uh, go any further, you know, find out more about it, uh, it sort of disappeared. So I don't know whether CBC got after him or not. Okay. Um, so my feeling from your response is, if it's a fan who really is doing it with the best of intentions, uh, you don't necessarily have too much of a problem with it. Uh, but it has to, as long as it doesn't hurt the integrity yes. of, what, of what you were trying to put yeah. out there. So uh, let's say somebody goes on to uh, GeoCities, creates their own website, and they call it a tribute to the Mr. Dress Up program and they'll have images from the program, uh, pictures of yourself with the puppet characters, maybe a little bio on what they've researched. Mm -hmm. You'd be okay with that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think there are some websites that... Uh, yeah, there are a couple. That, uh, and uh, I know one of them has a front page of a little local newspaper saying Mr. Dress Up is coming to town, <laughs> uh, which was uh, someplace out, in, out near Edmonton. and. Uh, I don't know how in the world they got that. Someday I'd like to go. I don't have. Uh, I'm not on 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 the uh, internet web. But uh, someday I'd like to go through all the ones, the, the sites, and see what's on them. And also, there's some misinformation on uh, some of them. I understand. Oh yeah. It'd be nice to clear yeah. that up. Um, one of the reasons that I really wanted to interview you for my thesis is that with the amount of conflicting stories on the net. It uh -huh. was just impossible for me to, to pinpoint uh, any of the answers to my questions. Yeah, there is a there's a CBC uh, site website, and uh, and I guess you can click on Mr. Dress Up on that and get some information. But I know on one uh, one apparently this uh, it's sort of a chat thing, you know, different people saying I, I saw the show here, or you know, mm -hmm. I, I did this and so forth, and once. Uh, said that uh, Judith Lawrence had uh, was dead and that uh, the puppets were buried with her. Mm -hmm. I read the same thing. <laughs> Another one said that you and Judith were uh, were married <laughs> and that uh, due to a divorce that that was part of the split. And <laughs> it's really hilarious. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that... Well, there was a rumor going around the country at one point that I was dead. <laughs> and uh, it started... Uh, I think it's even uh, Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, went right across the country and then back again. And uh, it kept getting better and better. First, it was just that I was dead. And then it was that I had died of AIDS. And then I had committed suicide because I had AIDS. And uh, shortly after that, we were actually uh, going to tour uh, Nova Scotia. And people, when it was advertised, people uh, were calling uh, in Halifax saying, how can you advertise a Mr. Dress-Up show when he's dead? And <laughs> they'd say, no, he's not dead. He's coming here next week. And they'd say, well, I know he's dead. <laughs> and they'd say, well, how do you know? Well, um, I somebody told me. <laughs> it's uh, part of the game. Wow. That's... That's got to be something to to find out from other sources that you're dead. Yeah, it, it was highly exaggerated, as Mark Twain said. You're listening to Frank Talks, Pleasures and Lifestyles. And I'm Frank because I have to be. In that very last interview segment that you heard, Ernie Coombs talks about reports of his death. 
that he received while he was still fully alive. The irony, of course, is that four weeks after he did this interview with me, he actually did pass away, making this his last official recorded interview. I would like to dedicate this episode of Frank Talks to Ernie Coombs and dedicate this episode to the legacy of Mr. Dressup. Thank you, Ernie. I'm Stephen, and welcome to Frank Talks, a reading from. Today's reading comes from CBC News website dated Tuesday 18, September 2001. Excerpts from published news. Mr. Dressup's Ernie Coombs dies after stroke. Ernie Coombs, who played the much-loved television character Mr. Dressup, has died in Toronto after suffering a stroke the week of September 11, 2001, along with TV pals Casey and Finnegan. The kindly Mr. Dressup was a staple of morning television, entertaining generations of Canadian children with simple crafts, sing-alongs, and trips to the tickle trunk for costumes. Harkening back to a time before video games and expensive toys, Mr. Dressup encouraged children to use their imagination. Coombs first started the character in 1964 after moving to Canada from his native United States, along with fellow kids show personality Fred Rogers. Coombs retired as Mr. Dressup in February 1996, but continued to keep up a hectic schedule of personal appearances in character. In 1994, Coombs was awarded a Gemini for his lifetime contribution to Canadian television. Among countless other awards, the show won an actor for Best Program. He became a Canadian citizen in 1994, years after he was considered a Canadian cultural icon. Coombs, who lived in Pickering, Ontario, is survived by three grown children, Christopher, Kenneth, and Catherine Minow. His wife Marlene died in a traffic accident nine years ago. Ernie Coombs was 73. The show still airs across Canada in reruns. And that was an excerpt of CBC News website dated Tuesday, September the 18th, 2001. For Frank Talks, a reading from, I'm Stephen.